Um, great, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. And uh, is that level okay? Um, so as proper with K-12, we are going to start with a game. So what I'd like you guys to do, plus it's after lunch and I know how everyone's feeling, what I'd like you guys to do is take out your phone or your laptop and you are going to go to the following website, Kahoot, as in K-A-H-O-O-T, dot I-T, Kahoot dot I-T. And I am going to trigger this game here. And how many of you have heard of Kahoot? Okay, so you, for those of you who have not, you're in for a treat. And let's see if we can get this centered. And just one second. There we go. Okay, so we're just gonna play it this way. Um, what we're gonna do is you're going to go to kahoot.it and you're going to enter in, the game pin at the top is going to appear Connecting. Three, zero, three, six, five. Does everyone see where you enter in that code? Okay, so while everyone gets ready, it's gonna ask you for your names, it's gonna pop up. So Kahoot is the latest and greatest uh, trivia game for classroom teachers. We also like to think of it as bar trivia without the bar, beer. Um, but it is fun, it's a good review, it's a good way to review information. Um, you can do it individually or you can do it in teams. So I've prepared a little trivia for you and we'll see uh, who's good with Moodle trivia. Um, one of the things you need to know is that not only your information but the speed at which you select your answer is important. And before we begin, I will give you a little bit of information about how the quiz will work. The question appears on the screen, and what you're gonna see are four um, squares for the answers. And then you just select the, the, the correct one that corresponds with the answer you choose. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and start it. And are you ready? There's only four questions, you better get in quick. First question. We'll see how well you guys know this. Four seconds, three seconds. <laughs> so what's fun about Kahoot is that you actually get your responses right away. So a lot of people thought 1999, I see that. Correct answer is 2002. Only 17 people got that correct. And I hope that's correct. Um, all right, so next question. And we have Michelle, where's Michelle in the lead? You should say on your screen that you are in first place. Okay, here we go, next step. I guess it's a mixed trivia. <laughs> so we have about 135 people playing, more than that, that's great. Awesome, all right. Uh, we have one person that said Saint. Maybe they're at the Saints game last night. And Michelle is still holding the lead. Where is Michelle? Oh, they, oh you are winning. I thought it was you. Okay, Tr uh, Troy, you're not giving her the answers. Troy helped me make the quiz, okay. Um, next question. Ooh, all the techie techs are like, I know this one. All right, almost done here. Get your answers in. All right, so kind of across the board, but eight, that's awesome, seven million plug-in downloads. And the last question. Ooh, Adam has taken the lead. Oh, nice, okay, right in front. Next question. Um, this is a very important question to me. 
Um, and there it is. This is a uh, inside joke between me and my colleagues. And I, I think this is the perfect place to ask it. <laughs> okay. I, I, there's no, I think both, I, I put dongle and adapter as the correct answers. It's a debate, and if anybody wants to school me on what the correct um, uh, noun is for this, this object, I would love to hear, because uh, anyways, it's a backstory. Okay, um, so ooh, we have to stay on the page because we have to see who the winner is, and ooh, Adam pulled it off with the win. All right, so a little bit of after lunch trivia. We do like uh, to keep things active, so we're just gonna quit that one. And then we're going to have to quit every other version that's running in the background, because I hear more noise. Uh-oh. <laughs> Sorry, technical difficulties. Um, there, oh, no, that's not it. All right, we're just going to have to, I don't think it's anywhere else. We'll mute for now. Okay. So my name is Kristen Daniels, and I am Innovation Coordinator at Cam Cambridge Isanti Schools. Cambridge Isanti Schools is about an hour north of the cities here. And um, I love my job, and so as I approach speaking to you, I um, wanted to make sure everyone knew that I am very passionate about my work, and I primarily work with um, K-12 teachers. And as Michelle said, I want to talk to teachers about transforming their role in the classroom. So I'm very excited to be here. I think this is an awesome conference. Uh, I've never been to this before, and I think it's an extremely diverse group. Um, obviously, we have many different roles, and it makes it a very rich uh, place for conversation, because we can learn a lot from people in different um, areas that we work in. So I was, I was on Twitter, and I was looking at uh, some pictures, and I noticed that some people went to the Saints game and there was an ear, nose, and throat race. Um, I tried to dig a little bit and figure out what the origin of that was, and it seems like it's been going on for a number of years. Um, so whatever the reason it was, it sort of triggered something for me, um, and it goes back to something that Brittany mentioned when she was or welcoming, uh, welcoming everybody to the University of Minnesota. Um, all the accomplishments and the innovation that have come out of the University of Minnesota. And I actually have a very um, personal story as well, um, and it, it actually uh, segues into my passion for education. So I have two girls, they are 11 and 13, and um, they are both deaf. Um, they were not born deaf, they were born hearing. But it was here at the University of Minnesota Medical Center that they received cochlear implants. Um, and they are absolutely normal kids, mainstreamed in the schools. And um, I just think it's remarkable, the world we live in, and the technology that's available to us. So the reason, um, and here's a picture of them now, the reason um, I think about kids like Taya and Annalise is that every student is different, and our schools right now are um, extremely traditional. They haven't changed for a long time, and I have this grand idea that um, we can make it change. <laughs> um, and as anyone knows, making systematic change is extremely hard. But we do live in a very amazing time right now. I've been doing tech integration work for almost 10 years, and when I started doing it, um, there were a lot of changes that were happening. And this is even after Moodle. Um, but just, this is like from my head, it's not any brain stuff, but I just started um, doing a few things. And as an educator, K-12, higher ed, that's a lot of changes in the last 10 years. A lot of tools that we're able to use, and a lot of um, implications for um, what type of students we're seeing, what their expectations are, and um, what, you know, what the opportunities are for making that shift. I don't know if that's on. Um, I, I'm very blessed to have the job. Like I mentioned, I, I really, really love working with people. And um, I mean, my passion is watching a teacher sort of take a risk and make a change towards creating a different en environment for their students. Um, I, I believe that um, our classrooms should be very student-centered, and there's a lot of 
frameworks out there, and I'm not really good with like, you know, mentioning all of them, but you know, when it comes down to it, and I think about my kids, and I think about other kids, um, it's important that our kids have the ability to be creative, and I do like the four C's. Um, critical thinking, creativity, um, communication, and I'm forgetting the last one, of course. Um, collaboration, and there's lots of C's too, but they're all really important. Uh, so in my work every day with, with teachers, I'm challenging them to um, sort of rethink their work and their role as a teacher in education. So I am an innovation coordinator in Cambridge I Sandy Schools, and innovation coordinator, that is a buzzword if there are, is any. Uh, <laughs> how many of you have the word innovation in your title? Okay, and is that in the last two or three years? Right, exactly. It, it's all language and it's words, and um, I'm okay with taking the opportunity to, to put that on my title and say, yep, I'll take that task on, because I think it's important that we have resources dedicated to people thinking about how we can make changes. Um, if you have read anything about innovation, um, there's, there's sustainable innovation and there's disruptive innovation, and my ultimate goal is to, to create disruptive innovation in my school district. And I, and I put this up there because Cambridge I Sandy Schools is a smaller school district in Minnesota, and, I, uh, and the leadership is wonderful, and so I think that um, where we put our passion and the people that we work with is critical to our success, to reaching our goals. So the reason I'm here today is to share with you what's going on in K-12, what is happening, and um, part of my work has been done with the flipped classroom, and it's really an amazing opportunity that teachers are um, taking advantage of, um, but there's a lot of challenges to that, and navigating the language of that, um, what it looks like, how you communicate to parents, how it fits into everything else that's going on. But it really, um, <clears throat> the, the most recent trend of the flipped classroom and the buzz started probably about eight years ago when um, John Bergman and Aaron Sands started using capture, screen capture technology to record their lessons. And I, I like to tell their story because it, it, they, they started doing it to solve a problem. They were teaching in a rural school in Colorado and they had kids who were leaving for sports um, at you know, like one in the afternoon and so they'd miss class almost every day. So they just started recording from the back of the room originally. And when they started doing that, um, the students who were accessing the videos were not only the students who were leaving on the bus, but other students in the classroom. And so John and Aaron sort of looked at each other, they're chemistry teachers and they collaborate. They're like, huh, this is interesting. Um, more than just the sports kids are watching these videos. I wonder what would happen if, and so then they explored the idea of what if we intentionally created this content and put it out there for our students to access even before they came to class. And then as chemistry teachers, um, they're like, oh, we, we could do more labs in school or in class. So they started making screencasts, and this is uh, just a screenshot from one of those. Um, and they, they would do them together, and they created these rich uh, videos with annotations and conversation between the two of them. And people started paying attention, so they started hosting every summer, uh, they called it the flip conference or whatever it was called then, um, and, and it grew and it grew and it grew. And this year we just had the eighth annual FLIP conference in Michigan. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So how do we start talking about the FLIP classroom and why is it important? Um, I think one of the reasons why it's important is that in K-12, you know, kids, they grow up and then they go to higher ed and, they, and then they go out into the workforce. So it's important to have the conversation. How many of you are parents? Okay. And how many of you have students who have been in a flipped classroom, whether it's been named that or not? Anybody have it like intentionally named? Okay, a few of you. Um, the, the language around flipped classroom is tricky, and, and um, after I sh show you this uh, diagram, I'll talk a little bit about that. But this was created by Audrey McLaren. She's an educator in Canada. And um, it's a sequence of um, images that I think really demonstrate what the flipped classroom was or is in the beginning. And so in traditional class time in K-12 and a lot of higher ed as well, um, you have the lesson in the upper right hand corner, it's not really a corner is it, in the upper right hand part there, um, where the purple is representative of the teacher and the student is in yellow. 
And then uh, the student is typically sent home to practice, right? Everyone knows, see this is the other thing, we all have this in common. For the most part, this is the experience we share together. And uh, the student goes home to do homework by themselves, the teacher's not there, and they, and they practice what they've learned, right? Okay, uh, again, if you have kids, and uh, primarily younger kids, maybe fifth or sixth grade, and they bring that math homework to you, and they say, that's not the way the teacher taught me to do it. Okay, well, so we send the kids home to practice the stuff, and it's the hard stuff that they're doing, because they haven't really understood it yet. Um, so that's challenging. There we go. And when they return to class, there the teacher does answer questions and reviews whatever homework and, and moves on then, right? So if a teacher or if a student has a question, but the teacher has to get to the next lesson, a lot of the times there's um, not enough time to address those issues. So in the, the very basic flipped classroom, and the, the reason I say the very basic is because the flipped classroom is not one thing. Um, the flip learning is not just one thing. There's not like a prescription of how you do it. But a lot, of, a lot of teachers start this way. We call it the basic flip. And they just transfer the lesson out of the group space, out of the group space that's in the classroom. And they allow the student to access that information in a video format, whatever it might be, and the arrows the multiple arrows there are very important because now the student has control over the content. They can access it when they need to access it. They can replay it when they need to replay it, review, rewind, listen to it again, etc. Once they do that, they come back, and since they've just been introduced to the content, now is the time when they practice. But the important part here is that this is where the teacher is for help and questions. So if you picture that kid who is frustrated doing his homework, the teacher's there to help him. And there are a lot of other things that happen because of that, and that's why uh, this whole idea of flip learning or um, flip classroom is exciting to me, is what happens in the classroom. But that's not always what people are attracted to. It's not always what people get excited about at first. And I'll talk about how you sort of utilize that hook um, for teachers. So um, Audrey, Audrey just did this, and I think it's a great way to say this is the first shift. Usually teachers start this way. So the question that we ask is, what is the best use of our class time? As experts of content or experts of pedagogy, it's so important that we are there with the kids when they need our, the help the most. And um, the flipped classroom allows the teacher to start to make that transition of how can I spend my time better? So my fascination with flipped classroom and flipped learning stems from two things. Um, number one, um, I have always loved video. I have always been um, interested in photography and um, sharing information in that manner. Um, I think that this is something I share in almost all of my presentations. Um, information literacy is so important for teachers these days. And uh, in my work with teachers, it's, it's a, it, that's, that's everything. How do you access information? How do you, you know, validate it? How do you find it? How do you organize it? How do you share it? How do you create it? Um, that's the type of teacher we need. We need, um, we need uh, information literate teachers to be working with our students. So for me, using video to convey information and content is, is something that's very interesting to me. So I was thinking about this um, fire hydrant that I've had in literally on my computer or on a hard drive for at least like eight years. And when I was at a conference in July, somebody shared an image very similar to this um, of a little girl drinking out of a, a, a hose. <laughs> And I thought, okay, so if this is the internet, if drinking from a fire hydrant is the internet, then what does a conference look like? Or what is professional development? And so I thought, well, maybe it's like drinking from a hose. We all approach it differently. We all approach getting information differently. You could see um, there's a lot of different styles here of how to drink from that hose. 
Um, and I just thought, this is a great, this is great. So I'm going to share this. So for example, right here. <laughs> she's really going at it, right? She's really excited. Um, and this was actually the image that was shared at the conference because you get so much information. How many of you feel like this right now? A lot of information over the last three days, right? Okay, what about this guy here? I, he's kind of missing his mouth, right? But he's enjoying it. It's like, you know, going sideways. Okay? So, um, as I was sort of exploring this topic, then I discovered this. <laughs> and I thought, oh, maybe I shouldn't use that simile. Maybe um, it's a bad idea. But maybe that actually is very poignant, like PD. Maybe we shouldn't drink it in that way. <laughs> um, how many of you have been to a professional development one-hour session in your university where the content wasn't relevant to you? Or you were forced to be there, right? Okay, that my passion is eliminating that or fixing that or providing um, options for teachers. Voice and choice is important in a place like this. It's beautiful. So um, this is one, this is very critical today for educators to know how to get information, organize it, and share it. But the main reason that I became fascinated with the flipped classroom and flipped learning was that I saw a lot of potential in this opportunity. I saw a lot of potential in teachers sort of leaning and asking, well, what is this? What, what is using video? And um, as you will see, if you ever talk to flipped classroom educators, they always say, it's not about the video, my gosh. But you know what? A lot of people are curious about that video, and it starts with curiosity. And I have seen teachers go from just starting to, to ask, well, how could Digital content, and I use, I use digital content way more than I use the word video because it could be anything. It could be a video, it could be a blog, it could be a, um, a post, whatever it might be. Um, a forum. What, um, what is, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so, so it's interesting for teachers to say, well, how could that impact me or how could that make my, my class more engaging? So the, the biggest reason I, I was like, what is this flipped classroom is that I saw it as an opportunity to start a conversation with educators about what their role should be in 2015. We talk about the modern educator. We need to be changing our skill set. We need to be changing what we do in the classroom. So case in point, oh, this is where I'm going to really run into trouble because I'm going to have that Kahoot playing. We'll see what happens. Okay. Oops, sorry. Um, so the next video that you're going to see is, if I can get it to work, is a video of a boy named Audrey. And Audrey is um, a very curious child. Anybody good at finding where audio is coming from? Hi, Marjorie. Oh, you're right. Spaces. Do you know how to do spaces? Oh, geez, there it is. Got it? Oh. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, my. <laughs> okay, hold on. No, not that one. Oh, jeez. I started it, so I was very excited about Kahoot. Okay, I appreciate your patience Spinning there. This okay, so Audrey down here, is, uh, pushing uh, the top, he's made a Rube Goldberg machine. Board. Down here, around the spiral, down this ramp. Oh, jeez, no. This is where the technical hey, difficulties this happen. This control power socket. I'm sorry, you guys. Um, now I'm really in trouble. All right, so I think what I'm going to do is exit dual screen mode. Let me think about that. Um, all right, I'll describe what happens to Audrey. Um, so what happens to Audrey is he does this Rube Goldberg machine. He doesn't know how it's going to end up, and he. Um, 
it's really cute, his sort of enthusiasm for learning. And so, uh, if, how many of you, well, Rube Goldberg machines are super fun, but you never know what's gonna happen, and it's oftentimes um, a lot of failure that's included with that. I'm Audrey Clements, and I made a Rube Goldberg machine. A Rube Goldberg machine is a machine that creates a chain reaction, a really complicated one, to make to do a simple task. Um, so, my Rube Goldberg is going to start with this domino being knocked down. So he walks through what it's supposed to do. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. He's going to mark his success and failure. always work on the first try. So this is my chart. How much successes and how much failures. I think, I think we'll have, this is my hypothesis, and this is the actual. My hypothesis on successes is 2. I think it will have 10 to 20. 10 to 20 failures and two successes, but that's, that's my hypothesis. So I'm going to mute this for now, um, and I'll get to why I'm showing you this is um, sort of this curiosity. This is what kids can be like. This is why we need to sort of change what we're doing in the classroom. Audrey's enthusiasm for learning and his enthusiasm for failing is remarkable. type of kid that we need to create our classrooms for. So part of me is, is very excited to have this conversation with teachers. So my experience with the flipped classroom started when I was working in a school district in the East Metro area here, and we took fifth grade teachers and we said, hey, we'd like to try this with you. Now anything where somebody is saying, hey, we'd like to try this with you, the teachers are like, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? But the the reason it worked is we had relationships with these teachers. So it was important that we, um, they trusted us. So we did a flipped classroom pilot in the elementary level, and um, it, was a, it was a learning experience. We started with six teachers, and over the year we went to 30, and um, I think now there's up to 40 classroom teachers who are utilizing content in their math classroom with fifth graders. Um, we used Moodle to host all of our content, and we used the quizzing features so that teachers could have feedback on the, um, on the uh, student knowledge of the videos that they were watching. Um, again, there's, there's, we did a video every night for the kids, which was way too much for elementary school, in my opinion, but we learned that. That was a learning experience. Um, so after my sort of adventure in flipped classroom in, in elementary, um, I became connected with John and Aaron um, from Colorado, and um, they were interested in what we were doing. We had also done a flipped PD, um, so that, that's my passion is professional development. So how can I make professional development better using digital content? Uh, making sure teachers have access to resources that are relevant, and then only having our face-to-face -face time be time where they really want to be there. And so it was really a coaching model. Um, but in the Flip Learning Network, our goal is to share information about uh, Flip Learning. And so one of the first things we did was we had to define what is Flip Learning. Um, and if you can read here, it's sort of a, um, 
it is blended learning, but besides uh, having a blended environment, there's a huge focus on what happens in the classroom. And that to me is the exciting part when I talk with teachers across the country about what they're doing after they start flipping. It's after they start flipping uh, for a few years and they, and they start realizing all the different things they can do, all the spaces they can create in their classroom for different types of learning. The Flip Learning Network uh, also created the pillars of flip, uh, the pillars of flip learning in order to communicate what was happening across the country and what we were seeing in classrooms that were similar to one another. So um, yes, it's an acronym that spells FLIP. Uh, we sort of argued, do we want to do that? And I think it works really well. So as I introduce the pillars of FLIP, I want you to think about how Moodle could play a role in helping an educator sort of um, accomplish each of these things or facilitate uh, each of this type of um, what, what's happening in their classroom. So flexible environment, learning culture, intentional content, and professional educator. Those are, the, those are the things that we saw happening in the classrooms as traditional classroom teachers transitioned into a basic flip model and then through that, then they started doing new things um, after they had been flipping their classroom for a, a number of years. So flexible environment refers to three things. It refers to the actual physical space of a classroom, uh, which is very important in learning. But as teachers sort of, um, you know, if they're giving content to their students at night, then their class time is going to be very different. And so they had to rearrange their classes for that. And so they started to experiment with different ways of doing that. Flexible pedagogy, of course. Obviously, when they're in the classroom, they're not instructing the students anymore in a whole group setting. So they had to get creative with, okay, what am I going to do with my kids now? And that's actually the hardest question for flip classroom teachers is, what am I going to do with my kids now that I've already given them the content? Flexible assessment. This is a wonderful part of that, that has come out of this, is that teachers are now starting to assess their students in different ways. A lot more formative assessment and um, different ways allowing their students. Uh, the picture in the upper right hand corner is Aaron and he would walk around with a clipboard and have conversations with students and then check off if they understood the content or not. Like how wonderful is that? They don't have to take a quiz, he just has a conversation with them. And one of the benefits of the flipped classroom is that teachers felt like they were able to get to know their students much better. Um, learning culture is probably the hardest pillar for teachers. And what this means is shifting the role of the teacher and the student. Um, the, in the traditional classroom, the teacher is really, uh, the role is to disseminate information and make sure the kids understand it, but they have to kind of keep on a schedule and keep moving forward. Also, in a traditional classroom, they really struggle with differentiating for different types of learners. So um, the learning culture in a traditional classroom versus um, what, is, what evolves in a flipped classroom is extremely different. Um, part of it is that the, the student starts to change their role and they start to take more responsibility for their own learning. Why? Because the teacher is building that type of environment for them. The teacher is preparing um, content and activities time for discussion, and it's really up for the student to, to figure out whether they understand that or not. Um, check in with the teacher, and um, in this whole idea of metacognition, understanding um, what we do and do not understand. And then the, the teacher role shifts, obviously, and this is really hard for teachers as well. Um, a flipped classroom in the high school is a lot more challenging than in the elementary grades because High school teachers were getting a lot more pushback from their students. Is it, can anybody imagine why? Say that again? Oh, it's more work. It's, it's real work. And let's say you do this to a 12th grader. They're like, oh, what did you just do? Like, I got this game called school. I get it. I'm almost done. And you just messed it up for me, right? So um, that is a challenge. And this is where I do get excited. Intentional content, I told you it's one of the reasons why I really like the flipped classroom or flipped learning or blended learning or whatever you want to call it because it's about access to content. Um, and this is just a short list of the different ways teachers can use uh, 
content in their classroom. Um, FET videos from the University of Colorado, simulations. It doesn't need to be a video, it can be a simulation that you guide the students to use. So um, there's lots of different ways that teachers can be guided to use intentional content in their classroom. Um, these are some awesome apps that are available for teachers to capture, create. Um, uh, I love iMotion HD, it's super fun. <laughs> Um, but what this allows teachers to do is instead of starting with the content, instead of starting with remembering and understanding, they can actually start at the top of Blooms and have the kids create and analyze and apply. And when they need the content, they can tap down to it. Um, Troy Faulkner is sitting over here. He's from Byron, Minnesota. He's doing a session right after here. He's going to talk about different models of the flipped classroom. And one that he's going to talk about is from Ramsey Musalem called Explore, Flip, Apply. And it's a phenomenal model that doesn't front load the information for kids. Because we think that's the way we need to do it, but we don't need to do that. We can do inquiry and then we can feed the kids information when they need it and when they're ready for it. Um, and then the last one is professional educator. And this is, again, my passion is working with teachers. And I love it when teachers are really reflective in their practice. And it, it requires a professional educator to make the transformation to a blended learning environment, to a flipped classroom, because it, you really become vulnerable. You have to redo what, you, what your role is as a teacher. Um, so those are the flip pillars, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to, this is not magic. The, the title of my um, presentation is The Non-Magic of Technology. And um, I, I remember Martin talking on Tuesday about pressing a button and how he sort of thought about what happens when he presses that button. Like the teachers I work with are petrified of pressing the button. They think it's gonna blow something up. And so in my work with teachers, I have to remind them, it, the technology is not magic. It's the work that you do and the way you wanna work with your students and the questions you ask and you say, how can that technology work for what do I want to accomplish? Um, so that's sort of my, um, what, how I work with teachers. Um, the technology adoption curve, uh, so any, I'm sure you guys are aware of this. In my work, there's a huge gap. Um, there's lots of writing about this chasm. Um, and for teachers to sort of jump across to trying something new or venturing into a blended learning environment, they really need to understand why. Why am I doing this? Why is this going to be beneficial? How is this going to impact my students? And so what I try and do um, with my teachers, at least, is have those conversations and um, try and get them to sort of understand how technology can be used to benefit and enhance the work they do with students. Um, I think, I don't know if we have time for, oh yeah, okay. So um, this, I, I do, I have one more video. It's like one of my favorite videos I show teachers. And I don't know how it is in higher ed. And I don't, uh, but I have a feeling we're all kind of the same. When we try something new, we're a little apprehensive. So this video is one of my favorites that I show to teachers because um, it's a video of a nine-year-old girl going down a ski jump, a big ski jump for the first time. But she's wearing a GoPro camera and she's talking out loud. And her dialogue to herself is so rich. Um, and I think that teachers can learn from sort of how she approaches it. So we'll play that. I'll be fine. I'll do it. Well. Here goes something, I guess. Okay, you can do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump. You got it. Whoa, my ski's slipping off. Just remember, never snowplow, okay? No snowplows. That's her coach. Straight, you'll be fine. Do okay. You do on the 20. Straight. Do you go faster on the in run? A little bit. A little bit? Yeah. Is it any steeper, do you think? Not same, much. Same steepness, it's just longer. Well, just longer. Just longer. Just a bigger 20, that's all. Yep. Have it's fun. A bigger 20. Go ahead. You got this. I got it. <laughs> and 
then her, her peer says something to her. Okay. Here. The longer you wait, you'll be more scared. I. The longer you wait, the scarier it is. Go. Freaks you yeah. out. That's the only thing. It's so fun. Huh? 60 seems like nothing now. Whoa! Yeah, I love that. So um, I, I, the reason I show that is it, it's, it is scary trying something new. It's scary asking yourselves important questions about how you can become a better educator. Um, but I, I think that um, the little girl going down the hill and somehow the sun helped that video be perfect because you could see her celebration and her success. Um, so taking risks and, and being vulnerable as an educator is very rewarding. So I totally apologize for all the technical glitches. Um, so thank you for bearing with me and um, having me here. Thanks. <laughs>